You've chosen a podcast from Low Moon Outsiders. Enjoy. We are just did a little bit of uh, paperwork and updating. I can actually tell you by looking at the thing. This will be fun. It's uh, August 22nd, and this is session 2383 through 85. How about that? Look at, look at me being all organized. Yeah. Season 23, sessions 83 through 80, 85, which we'll probably only get 83 and 84, and it's the rate we're going. Um, whence last we broke? The outsiders were leaving the haunted village. You attempted to meet the young lady at the... Uh, well, which did not go well. <laughs> Very funny. Anyway, um, and instead, uh, you met a pack of ravenous wolves that seemed to be kind of like uh, rotting and mangy and like that. Um, and so uh, there was the potential of disease or uh, infection for sure. Okay. Uh, when you fled the village, the fog was still covering it very thoroughly. Visibility was nil. Um, you did take with you one. It really was the draft horse, uh, which had previously been towing the wagon cart thing that you had. And you, um, Lucas had saddled it, and it had it had responded fairly well uh, to being saddled. It's it's definitely a war horse, has a lot of scars from the past, uh, fighting and so on, but it's older. It's probably like uh, 13, 14 years old. So uh, it's definitely not a uh, long duration over the ground, you know, over uh, heavy terrain or hard terrain steed, but it will work uh, in a pinch. Uh, you led it out of the village because a stirred led you up into the hills following the girl's tracks. Um, the girl's name is Melody. So anyone wants to write that down for our future, uh, if you see her again, you will recall that she was adolescent aged, um, thin and pretty, dark haired. Um, and she had promised to meet you at the well, but then when you were there, she was never there. What's the city called? Just calling it the Haunted Village. She also did not say the name of the village. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so we're flashing forward to this moment. Uh, the walls of the room are stone. The um, fireplace is burning with a low flame. And the flue may be slightly backed up because there is a hint of smoke creeping into the room. A, a wooden door, reddish oak perhaps, uh, closes the main door to the room. And there is a balcony uh, that overlooks an area which must have some uh, activity in it as there are the sounds of talking and occasional sword clanging and that kind of thing. Um, in a bed, somewhat opulent in the room, uh, it is a twin bed, um, but it is a post bed, four post bed with a canopy over top of it. Uh, Clume rests sleeping soundly. Um, the sunlight streams in through the balcony, plays across a well, a beautifully woven oriental style rug that sits between the um, bed and the balcony. Um, a gentle breeze flits through the room and pushes the chiffon lace curtains, which would be, even if they were closed, very transparent, um, away in the direction of the bed. Um, Clume catches the fresh air and awakes. You are alone. Um, this room is a beautiful bedroom, uh, no hangings on the wall, but a beautiful bed, beautiful rug, There's a couple of other pieces of furniture. Um, and you notice immediately that all of your equipment, uh, including your cloak and various outerwear, backpack, whatever it is that you have, it's all stacked neatly to one side uh, in front of a basically an armoire that has a tall door. Uh, it probably could be for hanging clothes in. Um, and you're facing the, the balcony as the breeze blows in, and that's what awakens you. 
at first you don't recall how you got in the bed. Um, the last thing you remember for sure, eight, walk up into the hills. And you remember getting more and more tired as they kept pressing on. And a start was concerned that, the, that you would lose the tracks because it was late and um, rain was imminent. Okay. Um, okay, so the, you, all, the entire party was leaving the haunted village mm -hmm. after the conflict at the well, and following and Melody's tracks. Okay, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so you don't know where they are exactly. However, uh, then flitting in from uh, across the lip of the balcony comes sounds outside, as if just outside the balcony, there's quite a bit of activity going on. Um, so you could easily get out of bed and look and see where you are and who might be out there. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll go look. I'll get out of bed and go look out at the balcony and see what the noise is. Okay. In getting out of bed, uh, your bare foot bumps something cold and metallic that apparently was under the covers with you. And when you throw the covers back, you see that there is a bed warmer long spent. A uh, bed warmer is a it's metallic oval and it has a flap that opens they put hot coals in it from the from the fireplace close it up and then they have it usually has a pole on it and you slide it in the bed with you and it heats the covers up uh, but apparently that it's been long uh, expired it's no longer warm okay when you get out of bed you realize that you are dressed in um, basically like pajamas uh, you have a um, tunic that's obviously slip over and it's made of a very light silky material and then something akin to shorts um, made of the same material and they are blue and they have uh, thin lines of black going laced through them like um, embroidered okay comfortable very light in fact when you first got up you thought I think I'm naked and then you realize now we have very light very light material on okay so you approach the balcony push the blowing curtain back out of the way. As you step up onto the balcony, you realize it is a stone balcony with a two foot uh, columned stone rail around it. And uh, immediately you realize that you're up above the market area below, uh, which doesn't really give, it's not, doesn't have the normal appearance of a market. I'll explain it in a second. Um, but you're on a, a, a stone like cliff face or wall and then about a 30 foot drop down below you, and there are no stairs here, you'd have to probably go out the door, you think. Um, scattered all throughout this area, it is a valley, and it is lush and green. There are bushes and trees here and there, um, and grass grows in between them. And then um, here and there throughout that valley, there's a tent or uh, like a canopy, that kind of thing. And then also uh, there's a corral that holds horses. There's a, a little small fenced in muddy area that has pigs and like that. And so what you're seeing is a sort of a village basically outside the window. Um, but again, you're in, the, you're in the cliff base of a large stone hill uh, looking down on all of this. And as you survey the area, you see all of your party scattered throughout the area doing various things. And the first person you pick out, everybody roll a d6. Three, four, two. Okay, the first person you see is Lucas. And Lucas is doing what? Have we fought today? <laughs> no, we've been here for several days with no combat. It's safe here. Okay, with the sword, like weaponry, basically. All right, so he is sparring with another knight, roughly his, or warrior in heavy armor, roughly his size. Um, and around him, uh, there are another 10 or 12 individuals doing the same thing, and they have a varying uh, heaviness of armor. The most of it is chain mail. Uh, it's the heaviest, but the guy that he's fighting actually has plate mail. And first you... I mean, they're, they seem to be going at it pretty fiercely. Um, obviously, Lucas is 
probably stronger than him, because Lucas is stronger than most people. Um, but there, he manages to turn his blows aside with a shield, and they they're clanging back and forth of sword and shield and um, fighting around the general area that they're in. Um, from your perspective, it's about there. There, he's about uh, sixty yards away. So not too terribly far, really. Okay. Okay. Um, and because he was there, so so aggressively uh, sparring, it was pretty easy to pick him out of the crowd. Aaron roll a d6 if you would. Okay. Uh, so the next person you pick out is a sturd, and a sturd is doing. So you've been here for the better part of uh, almost four days. Your hand is healed. Remember, you took an impairing wound in the fight with the dogs. Um, and so you're back to the point where you can hold a weapon or uh, do, like, work on your arrows or work with your bow or yeah. practice with the bow. It's still sore, but it's healed to, to usable. Practice with the bow. Okay. So you spot a stirred in the far distance to the left. He's probably about 100 yards away. And uh, there's a uh, – essentially, it looks like if there's a couple of ba- – uh, bales of hay and then there's a bale of hay on top and then there's another two bales of hay on top of that and then there's another bale of hay on top of that and then there's a pole or something that's going down the middle it looks like it's probably made of wood uh, and then uh, there's some canvas that's been draped over it and it appears like they it's got a lot of nicks and marks in it and stuff they use it fairly frequently for target practice and you see he is there um, firing arrows into the that tar- that makeshift target, if you will. Uh, let's see. Uh, so he is the only person shooting a bow at the moment, uh, but there are several people that are kind of lingering around the area watching him shoot. Um, and one guy's working, like carving arrows or, or shafts of wood anyway that you think will be arrows eventually. Okay. Um, and then next, well, I'm sorry, James, what was your D6 roll? Three. Okay, all right, the next is Herrick. Uh, and you spot him somewhere in the village marketplace doing what? Um, what's the weather like? It is uh, warm and sunny, uh, low 70s, clear sky, uh, sparse clouds, airs, clouds drifting overhead. Um, it is probably about one in the afternoon. I have a question that might pertain to what's, what Herrick's doing. Okay. Um, what does Harry does Harry have herbalism or the relevant skills to teach someone herbalism? No. Okay. Unfortunately, on. not. Okay. I so can teach us uh, forest survival, but that's about it. So what is Herrick doing oh. as she spots him somewhere in the village? <laughs> uh, Herrick is just up on a building's roof, apparently working with somebody replacing thatch or preparing a leak in the roof or general maintenance on it. Appears to just be having a good, lighthearted conversation with whoever it is he's working with. And okay. Uh, enjoy interesting. Yourself. Yeah, interestingly enough, the person working alongside of Herrick is too short to be human. You think he's probably a halfling. Uh, he is kind of stout, uh, doesn't wear shoes, probably uh, three and a half to four foot tall at most. Uh, and he, the, the two of them are. So Herrick is actually uh, waist deep in the roof, and the halfling is crawling around placing the actual thatch and, and so on until the, and then when they they're, they're closing in on the hole at which point in time they'll uh herrick will have to get out of the hole obviously okay and then lastly you notice chiron and chiron is doing what um how large is this town it's relatively small right? size or population 500 okay uh, i guess Kind of er, somewhat early in what we would have done. I think Karen would have looked, just looked around to see if there's a paladin at all. He needs training now. Okay. If not, he, you know, he would just be upkeeping his normal training. And okay. Roll a d6 again. Okay. Taking care of his <coughs> things like that. Five. Okay. So. Um, in the middle, kind of in the middle of, middle of the village, you realize you're seeing pretty much the entire village now. Um, although there must be housing that's out of view because there's not a lot of houses there. Um, and um, 
in the middle of the village there is a mound of rocks and it goes up to be pretty pretty uh, elevated above the village precipice that's probably like uh, 12 feet across and then it goes down and it widens out goes down and it widens out but there is trees and bush and brush and everything growing in the middle of it um, in the various parts and there's a there's a clear flat surface on the top of it and Chiron is uh, seated on that surface uh, he looks abundantly comfortable in his heavy armor uh, and then you see a woman who is probably in her mid to late 40s she's not wearing a helm um, and she is beautiful uh, not pretty or cute. She's mid to late 40s. She's beautiful, square jawed. Uh, she looks strong. Um, and as she turns, she she's kind of seems to be like pacing around behind him. And as she turns, you can see that she is talking to him the whole time that he is sitting there and he seems to be praying or meditating. And she is talking to him the whole time. Um, but as she turns, you can see that she has a uh, silver holy symbol of Zeus uh, on her like hanging on a chain on the front of her uh, plate mail armor. Um, and as she turns also, you realize her hair is loose and, it, and each time she turns, it, her hair blows across her for a second before she shifts her head and lets it blow out of the way. So she's not making any attempt to stop that for whatever reason. Okay. okay. All right, so one of you also notices that she is awake. So everybody can roll a d20. A wisdom check or it makes it by the most will be the one that wake realizes that she's awake. Made by you rolled a three? Mm -hmm. You're fairly wise too, aren't you? What's your wisdom? Thirteen. Made, made by, by ten. Okay, you made by ten. I Lucas 16, didn't get so it. So thirteen. Okay, so Herrick is the one. So working uh, waist deep in the half of two house. Uh, work, working waist deep in the halfling's house. Uh, you have been checking, you know, which balcony is the one where she's been sleeping. And it has bothered you that she has now slept for three and a half days straight. Um, but everybody looked at her, Lucas and Kyra, and they said there's, you know, other than the minor scrapes or whatever that are left over, soreness, that kind of thing, there's really nothing wrong with her. Um, she's just lazy. <laughs> Sleepy, at or, least. Or attractive, one of the two. Yes. So anyway, uh, as you as you are working there, you handed some thatch to... Uh, uh, I have his name. I'll give you his name. Anyway, you hand some thatch to the halfling, and as you hand it to him and he tucks it in, you're left waiting with the next bundle in your hand for a moment, and um, his name is Frederick. And uh, he... He tucks it in, and as he does so, you look up, as you've done probably 30 times since dawn, and to your pleasant surprise, you see Klum standing in the aforementioned blue silken PJs, um, her hair blowing gently in the breeze and the curtains flowing behind her, that kind of thing, and she is looking out over the village. If you don't want to miss any of the story, Low Moon Origins, Uprising or Outsiders, like and follow our podcast. Please share it with friends. Um, any expression on your face at all when he looks? Um, maybe slight confusion, grogginess sort of thing. Um, okay. I'm just kind of evaluating what everybody's doing. Okay. So she looks a little tired, a little confused. Um, in fact, she takes her hand and holds her hair back and you definitely think there is an undertone of what just happened. <laughs> so. How far away? Um, 80 yards. Oh, so Yeah, that would be a pretty loud yell. <laughs> it would definitely so, be noticed yeah. by everyone in the yeah. village. Yes. So, in this. There is low murmuring, talking, Am I working, bow fire. Not that he can tell, mind you, from that distance, it's kind of like you're looking over the village. So, but if he waves, you would still see him because you're, you're 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 seeing the entire village at one time. You're just picking out individual people that we're looking for. Uh, roll a d20. I'll check something real quick. Eight. Okay. Uh, you also spot uh, Melody, the girl that was supposed to meet you at the well. 
Um, and she, she is actually offloading some stuff from a wagon and taking it into a large building that is thatched on the property. Melody. You do. Amazingly, you do. Okay. Somehow oh, you do. Okay. You don't remember walking here, but apparently you remember some of the things that happened before that better than you expect. Okay. And that is the normal state of affairs for what you're experiencing. Does Clue know what she's, why she's in the No, but you might be able to piece it together when you start figuring out what happened. Okay. You're, right now you don't know you slept for three and a half days yet. Yeah. You just know that you're not where you were, the last thing you remember was walking here. And we don't appear significantly older, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it hasn't been in a year. Um, Clue will gather her things, get dressed, put her stuff back on, and see how it's going to Okay. Um, as soon as... If I don't get her attention, regardless, I'm going to... Hey, I got to... Got to wrap this up and then... Okay. Go poke other You're people probably within know. 10 minutes of being done now anyway. Oh, he could probably do the I'll rest of it himself. It, he was qualified. It was just going to be a lot harder because of his height. As the rafters inside, the way the roof is sloped, for him to stand on the rafter and fix the hole, he would have to put something on it, like a ladder or another yeah. staff or something like that. Yeah, so it just was convenient for you to yeah. intervene. Oh, and I was looking for... And they, have shown you, and they have shown you remarkable hospitality. Um, they are the Hillcrest family, and this is the Hillcrest Inn roof that you're actually preparing. Okay, um, Ricky, as, uh, right, just as she turns to walk away, uh, you had shot, you had picked up, taken arrows from the target, and you were walking back down to shoot again, and you just looked up out of reflex. You've probably checked it a few times since you, every day, <laughs> for the last several days, you've been checking it periodically, and you, you see, you look up and see her turning to walk back in the room. It's definitely her. Uh, you recognized her, you know that it was her, not somebody else. But she doesn't, she's gone from view within a second because she was turning to walk back into the room. So it's enough for you to know that she's awake. You also, all of you know that you've been waiting primarily for that, uh, but there is one other event that you're, uh, that you're waiting for, which I'll fill you in on in, on, in a moment. Okay, so uh, you find all of your stuff to be meticulously laid out very organized, like even stuff that you normally wear on your right side is on the right side, that kind of thing. Um, you definitely do not recall doing that yourself or even exactly when you fell asleep. Um, you just remember being cold and exhausted and trudging on what you would say is beyond your endurance. Okay. Um, okay. All right, so you finish up, get down off the inner head that way. Uh, the two of you are unaware as of yet that she is awake. Yeah, if I knew about where they were, I would. I was going to grab them. Okay. And at least let them know. All right. So yeah, you definitely know the sounds of sparring are easy, and he's on the highest spot in the middle of the village, meditating or praying. So you've seen him all day. Like he's been there for several hours since dawn. All right, so Herrick finds Lucas, and he is he's clearly standing by to speak to you as soon as you can break off sparring. I guess I'll finish this match. <laughs> what did you do that warranted that? Let's say. Okay. He brings the sword uh, up just under the helmet of the person he is sparring with, and uh, they they lock shields and arms and stand in, but his sword is just up under the guy's helmet, and immediately uh, he says, I yield. Do you? Okay. He says, I do so appreciate our time together. I have been learning much. I'm glad to share. Now, if you'll excuse me, I believe I have a visitor. Okay, he backs away. I will go to. All right. Lucas steps up to Herrick. 
she's awake and moving around, so. Are we gathering? Do what you want, I just figured I'd tell you. All right. I'm just about finished here, so I'll gather my things. I'll go like Chiron and... Where did the start go? <laughs> may have noticed. Okay. So what are you doing at that point? What is Astur doing at that point? Uh, gonna head towards work and blue mask. Okay. Past. Yeah. So you had just gathered up all of your arrows and assessed what ones were in what shape and so on. And so, if you don't fire again, then you're ready to go now, pretty much. All right. So you're heading up toward the. You, and all of you know how to enter the mount, enter the hillside, and what pathway to follow to get to her room. Um, there are a dozen balconies, um, and then there is a large lodge room. Um, that is pretty well camouflaged. Like you, there's a there's a kind of a fat lady squeeze basically that goes in and goes upstairs and, and goes up into this lodge area, and the village retreats into that area and they have stores and so on as a stronghold whenever there is trouble or danger or whatever. Um, and then the residences uh, generally overlook the balconies. So there are a dozen or so well-off families uh, that own or at least maintain financially one of the spaces inside the hill. Okay. Um, so are you letting Chiron know as well then? Yes. Okay. So let's see even odd, even before odd after. Okay. So all right. So uh, he is still meditating and his trainer is still walking behind him talking uh, when you arrive at the bottom. Now it is a 30 foot climb, which there's some, it's not steps per se, but there's some well-worn indentations that go up toward the top of the uh, platform, toward the top of the boulders. Unless you have another means, you would have to take the well-worn way. Oh, take the well-worn way. Well, yeah, it's not worth using. The, not worth. Not worth flexing. Today. Flexing muscles. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah. So you you walk up um, as you're as she's continuing to lecture you uh, on basically talking about matters of faith, and she's in particular talking about how faith um, is a weapon like a sword like a mace, like a lance. And, and she's talking about how when a sword strikes, faith strikes first. When a mace strikes, faith strikes first. Um, and so she's basically stating that you will find that your faith will lead you in every strike rather than in every choice. The choice, most people make the mistake of thinking that Faith governs whether or not you will strike, which while that may be true, faith then strikes first before the weapon is even swung. And then while she's having that conversation with you, uh, Herrick, who by no means would probably disagree with those statements, even though they are not druidic in nature, uh, arrives just head above the edge of the platform. She immediately notices him and uh, and then she stops, clears her throat, turns once more into the wind so that the wind blows her hair behind her, and then turns her head to the side and says, A friend has arrived to speak with you. Oh, oh, nice. A brief interruption. She's awake. Oh, wondrous. <laughs> and then that's my brief interruption. <laughs> okay. She oh. says, well, we I'll are, see you later then. We are through for now. <laughs> You may check on your friend. Very good. I am ever grateful for your teachings. I think the teacher benefits from the student as much as the student benefits from the teacher, especially when you count the tuition. I suppose that speaks enough for itself. I will see you at dinner. 
the sock head down the back. Okay. You slip down off the, the top big yeah, boulder right. doesn't really have a purchase or steps or whatever, so you just kind of slide off and then you're on a little platform and then the steps go down yeah, from there. I'm grab my water skin and whatever else I might have a, with me here. Okay. Take it down with me. All right. Uh, meanwhile, elsewhere, you have re-equipped yourself. Um, are you going so far as to like put everything on that you would normally adventure with, or are you more like you would be in a town, like this is your room, or what? Um, I'm going to take everything with me equipped to travel, because um, okay. I don't really know what's going on, and I'm going to seek out uh, Herrick, who's the person I saw with David me, so... Okay. Yep. All right. So you're fully dressed and equipped, and all everything's on. Um, so two things of interest that you found that were there that you have to decide what you're going to do with. One is the pajamas. So you have blue silk pajamas, very stylized with black embroidered, um, basically vein pattern, basically through the material. Um, so you have to decide, are you taking those with you or are you leaving them behind? Uh, I'll fold them and put them on the bed. Okay. And then the other is a bottle of wine. It's about uh, two-thirds the size of what normal bottles you're familiar with. And it is ruby, it's ruby colored glass. And it has a plain four inch by six inch label that is on it and that, that edge is curled back a little bit. Um, and then on the label, uh, do you speak Elvin? Elf. Elf. Yes. Okay. So it are the, on the label are written the words um, in Elven, epic taste. It's an epic taste. For elves. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I will. I will inspect it, um, but ultimately leave it behind. Okay. All right. So yeah, you can just leave it sitting in the armoire. That's where you found it. Okay. Um, roll a d20. I'm sorry. Roll a d20. Okay. As you turn away from the arm, not armoire, now fully equipped, um, you have a sort of a flashback, like a memory. It's almost, it's almost like PTSD because it's very vivid, like you're living it. For a second, it's enough to cause you to stop uh, in your tracks as you absorb what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And you see um, the party in this room, all of your friends, and uh, these four anyway, um, and also a the blonde woman that you saw on the rock outside. Um, and uh, um, Chiron is announcing, uh, there was nothing truly wrong with her. And then you see yourself laying in the bed um, and the woman is just pulling the covers up over top of you and she says I'd say she needs a good rest and then the image is gone Ricky can you move that turn this light on too it's getting darker and we'll be even more darker once we move the curtain I was throwing light. It's <laughs> <laughs> right in here. Yeah. Plenty of light that now. Makes my eyes feel much better. <laughs> <laughs> I just got my box of my new contacts today. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. And so then, having recovered from the flash, you step to the door, you open the door. Um, there are some people moving about in the hallway. A couple of them uh, evince surprise at your being awake, uh, but you don't recognize them and they don't accost you. They just oh, she's awake kind of thing. And you gather they are servants. They are a mix of humans and halflings. So you see five people total. Three of them are human, two of them are halfling. Um, and one of them motions you toward the exit. When you come, you go down a set of stairs down to the right. And then there's like a four-way intersection, has a set of stairs going down to the left, the one you're coming off of, another going up ahead of you, and then a hall that goes to the right. And you take the hall going to the right, and as you do so, you're coming out into the sun. Um, and it is probably about uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, based on the position of the sun. 
So it's, it's not high in the sky, but a little past. Also, the sun uh, is from the doorway, the sun is a little to your left. So it's a little to your left and slightly behind, um, indicating if you're in the, still in the same part of the world that you were in before, you're fairly sure that um, that, that is south, that left is south. Okay. Um, as you step out into the sunlight, you see this beautiful village laid out before you. There are no signs of war here, no signs of uh, dead here, no signs of uh, obvious trouble. However, um, you do now see at both ends of the valley, uh, also across the valley and to the left, to the left from your point of view, uh, there are towers. They're roughly three stories tall and they are uh, manned, like they're soldiers watching over the village. Okay. Um, and then scanning the village in front of you, uh, you see over there a stirred picking his way through uh, the trails that go through the middle town. So there's no roads, it's just worn grass where people walk and everywhere else there's, there's uh, small houses, thatch houses, uh, canopies, a wagon or two, that kind of thing. It's just not, it's, it's very rustic, okay? No sign of any fire other than the one that you saw in the fireplace. Um, and then there, the one big inn, which big building looks like an inn, that's the one he was working on, and there was smoke coming out <coughs> of that chimney, and it's the only one. Um, and so you see a stirred coming from ahead to your left, and you see Herrick coming from ahead to your right. And then uh, from here, where you are right now, you no longer see Lucas, um, and you no longer see Chiron, at least in that moment when you step outside. It is dry. It is warm. It is, um, it is probably the most comfortable day that you've experienced since leaving home a couple months ago. Okay, so what do you do? How far are a third in here? Uh, maybe 30 yards, not too far. I'll just... I'll just wait for them because they're coming from obviously. Yeah, and they will. There is no easy place for them to cross between where they are without going like across high grasses or through bushes or through a building. Um, so here is the best place to meet. There's a kind of a big courtyard right outside the um, cave mouth. Yeah, I'll just um, I'll just keep studying my surroundings. I know that they're coming towards me, so I'll just wait for them. Okay. There. So she stands there and waits. So uh, the two of you arrive at Clume at roughly the same time. By that time, you see both Chiron and. Lucas have come into view and they are working their way across the village toward you. So within maybe a couple minutes later, they'll be there. Okay. Herrick and Asturd arrive at Clume. The village activity continues behind you. What do you do? Afternoon, sleepyhead. Where are we? Hillcrest. Hillcrest. How did we get here? We walked. I don't remember that. I remember being with a stirred. I remember being very tired. And just now I remember being in that room. How long was I sleeping? About three and a half days. Three and a half days? You got us a little worried. A stream of four small halfling, apparently all halfling, children come out the entrance of the cave behind you and run off into the village laughing and giggling, an attitude of play, basically. So how did we get here? We walked. <laughs> <laughs> how did I finish getting here? How did we, I made it all the way here? Yes. Whose yeah. house are we at? Well, that's the main, basically, redoubt of the village. Mm -hmm. It's where they retreat if there's any problems that manage to get in. But So the bed that she was actually sleeping in is maintained by the paladin, which is the same paladin that's trained, currently training Chiron. Um, her name, contrary to her look, because she is very pale and pale, pale skinned and very pale blonde hair, but her name is Ebony. Uh, 
Um, you were actually in, Eb in Ebony's quarters. She maintains a room there. Ebony? Um, Paladin has been training Tyron recently I while see. we were waiting. He was, she was the one with him on, on the hill. At this point, Chiron and Lucas have arrived. They are just outside the main cave malls, if you will. Although it looks much more worked than that. As Chiron enters, he, he says, uh, or approaches, he says, I'm Lady Clume has returned to the world. <laughs> yes, feels good to be awake. Felt good to sleep, too. Is there like a... Meal around here, or like somewhere to get food. Yes. So you've been the entire party's been staying in the inn. It's the Hillcrest Inn. It's the only inn in town. Um, it is run by a family of halflings, the Hillcrest family, um, and they are directly related to the people who started the town, basically. Um, so we're at the inn right now. No, you're out. You're in the courtyard outside the cave complex that goes into the hill. And inside the cave complex, there are a dozen rooms or residences, because often they're more than one room. Um, and they are maintained by the wealthy families of the village, they either owned, because they go back to the original, they just got handed down generation to generation, or rented in some cases. And then also inside there, there is a large kind of lodge area, like a big, call it like a common room. Um, it's pretty huge, you've been in it. Um, 60 by 200 and they store a lot of like uh, dry goods and stuff like that there and if there's a problem the, the entire village can retreat inside the mountain basically. Um, and you've seen it you haven't been in every little room or nook and cranny or anybody's private chambers or anything like that but you know that ebony the paladin maintains a room there she is the ranking uh, person of faith if you will in the village so she essentially runs the those who worship Zeus, which is maybe Chiron probably knows. It's not a lot, you know, a dozen, fifteen, something like that. And you see, they tend to congregate together together at dinner. You saw them do that the last couple of days, or they'll be you see them walking together in the village. So that kind of thing. It's the cult of Zeus, basically. <laughs> Interested in giving financially to Low Moon and support the campaign? Text L-M-G-I-V-E, that's L-M-G-I-V-E, to 419-419-0095. Anyway, the inn that you're staying at is a Hillcrest Inn, and in particular, uh, Edward uh, is the chef of the inn, and he makes some really awesome food. They are all halflings, the entire family. So they're not they're not human sized. They're stout halflings, mm -hmm. and um, he is he is a proud man and extremely proud of the inn. And it is a pretty good size building. Um, it's a store and a half, uh, and uh, they have a common area for sleeping on upstairs, and the, they rent about a, about eight rooms downstairs. Um, each of which could handle four or five people, but doesn't actually have beds for four or five people. They do a lot of sleeping on the floor here. Is it common for inns to have the rooms downstairs? Um, no. Most, like in the city and stuff, they're typically the rooms are upstairs, um, up a single flight of stairs, and then there'll be rooms and then another flight of stairs and more, if it's tall enough or more. But so here, all the buildings are built pretty low to the ground. The only thing that's above a story and a half in the entire town are the watchtowers and the center rock. So, but it wouldn't be like super uncommon in like villages in the country? No, in villages it would be pretty common, yeah, because building two stories is more effort, requires more technology and more labor and more cost. Okay. And our, so, so, Generally speaking, in architecture, it's easier to build out if you have the space than it is to build up. Yes, that makes sense. Because they can just build on another couple of rooms, build on another couple of rooms, block. You don't have to, you don't have to take time. the roof off to add the base yeah. to put the roof back on. Yeah, but it does. It does look like this is a. It's a. The building is white, uh, whitewashed, and the roof is thatch, thick thatch, 
and it looks like the building has been here for a long time. Like it's not been added on to and stuff. In fact, it's probably the original, the original like stronghold or whatever of the town. Um, anyway, so Edward is the father of the family and he is an extremely talented chef. Uh, they do have, they sort, they serve four meals a day. Um, and they have hot food around the clock pretty much, uh, except for like the, the middle of the night from like 2 a.m. to about 5 a.m. So other than that, about 21 hours a day, you can get hot food. I'm going to turn to Clue and say, sleeping for so long, would you like to have something to eat? Okay, roll into 20. Food. Okay, so immediately upon the mention, the thought of food or whatever, you realize, yes, you're you're risking not feeling well. Like your stomach is upset and queasy, your head hurts, and you realize, yeah, you think eating would be good. Sounds like a great idea. I can run to get something if you want to catch up. Perhaps we should just all go. Fine with me. Okay, so as you're walking toward the village, and we'll just kind of breeze through this part for everybody's sake. Uh, you're sharing with her the, that your reasoning for waiting here is not only to, for her to wake up, because carrying her around wasn't, you know, going to be all that fun. Uh, but on top of that, you are waiting for um, a, a bard slash traveling minstrel who is actually Ethan Hillcrest. Uh, Ethan Hillcrest is a halfling, uh, of course. He is an adventurous spirit, and he generally leads guided hikes around the hills. Um, he is kind of outgoing. He's musical, but he mostly only plays like a pipe, um, like like uh, pipes. Like, what do we call it? Sorry, we we'll just call them pipes. But anyway, um, and he uh, he left the day before you all arrived, and he is due back any time. Like he was actually the first he could have come back was last night, but he didn't show up last night. So, so you're hoping he'll come sometime today. And the reason you're waiting for him is because he visits all of the local villages in the area. Yes, like that. Pan flute. Hand flute. Okay. Pan. 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 Okay, yeah, I'll yeah, take so that. I'll take that. Yeah. They, they're not they're not Greek, however, so I'm not sure if they would uh, we'll just call it that. It's fine. He plays the pipes. And anyway, he visits all of the villages around here uh, in, in pursuit of his business, which is providing guided, guided hikes and also in passing news and like that. And that's what he does that on top of he works some at the inn with his family. Um, and so if Serena is in the area, remember that this whole thing is about finding Serena, that they fled from their village in this direction um, and so if she is in the area he is the person to ask and he is due anytime so he could have come back last night but he didn't and no one I mean it's not like you can go looking for him because no one like he, he doesn't tell anybody well I'm going to this village first then there or whatever it doesn't he, he's a little too wild for that again his name is Ethan Hillcrest Right, and so you're on the way to the inn, and basically you say, "Oh, we can check and see if Ethan's back in town yet," because we've all been you've all been busy doing stuff this morning and early afternoon. Um, so I presume everyone is going to the inn then. Yep. Yeah. Okay. On arriving at the inn, you see the beautiful, previously described building. Uh, so now. Be aware from the outside, it would appear that from the ground to the edge of the thatch, it's only about four feet. So the thatch comes very near the ground. Um, now, once you actually get inside the building, you've been inside it quite a bit, you duck to get in, but then the roof is plenty high enough. It's 10, 12 feet high. Um, so it's not anything like that. But you, do, you are aware that you go down a few steps, so it's not like built at ground level. You're actually going in, going down, Four, four steps down, three stairs, four steps down. And then uh, at that level, then the ceiling is 12 feet overhead, which to them appears to be a you know, kind of high arched ceiling, basically. But to all of you, it's just 
plenty high enough. Um, okay. Uh, upon entering, you realize that uh, lunch is still well underway. Uh, and you see a mix of individuals in the inn. Uh, there is music being played. It is not expressly pipe music. Um, there is quite a bit of language uh, talking going on, and it's common. Uh, halfling tongue is, is a different tongue from uh, common tongue, but it is very similar. Um, common. Halfling and Elven languages are being spoken in the room. Uh, people are talking. Oh, that was loud. Okay. Anyway, uh, and a stringed instrument plays. Uh, the fireplace is not lit. The smoke that was coming out of the chimney was coming from the kitchen. Um, and the smell, the robust smells of food, immediately uh, attract your attention and what and you want to eat. Okay. I need to make another contract. Roll to 20. Yeah, no problem. That's a d12. Try d20. Oh. I'm going to make it every time I make d12. 13. Okay, I think you made it. What's your problem? Uh, 17. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. All right. So you do feel a little weak. Uh, not that you have any knowledge of it, but kind of like blood sugar type, whatever. Um, and you definitely feel like you can eat. And... Uh, as you all walk in, there's nowhere for everybody to sit together because there's nowhere in the room that there's space for five people to sit. Um, but then you see Ed, Edward, who's still wearing his white apron, and he actually wears leather armor under his white apron. Uh, he does not wear any shoes. Uh, he doesn't have any facial hair, but he does look fully the part of an older man, like human years, probably uh, early 50s is what he looks like. And, um, but he's short. He's uh, just under three feet tall. He's two foot eleven, which is sh short for a stout individual. And so uh, he immediately moves into the crowd and he moves some people to sit with some other people that they didn't come with, basically, to free up a table so you can all sit together. Move over here! Move over, come on, move over here! It's all right. She doesn't bite. You should know each other, anyways. Your drink is empty. Did you tell Olivia? Oh, good. I'm sure it'll be here shortly. Thank you for moving. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Edward. Oh, least I could do. And, uh, I just he, he actually to a couple of other people as I move He stops and pulls the heavy wooden chair out, which is quite an effort for him, uh, so that you can be seated. He goes, Woo! Thank you so much. Food's on the way. I imagine you're famished. The whole village has been talking about how good a sleeper you are. <laughs> okay. Uh, Olivia, which most of you have seen before, uh, is the daughter. Uh, and she, uh, again, halfling. She's more petite and slightly taller than most of the other halflings in the family. And so she's probably about uh, four, four. Um, and she wears a, a beautiful arrangement of flowers in her hair. It's not very big, it's like this big on the side of her head. Uh, so it doesn't cover her whole head, it's not a shawl or anything like that. But um, it is made of at least six different types of flowers, none of which you have seen in the village. So she must have her own special place that she gets the flowers from. Um, and she brings the drink to the guy whose drink was mostly empty. And then she takes the, uh, you notice, all of you notice that she takes the half empty mug. Uh, and then she stops by another table on the way back to the bar and pours what was left in his mug in another guy's mug when the guy's not looking. Um, and then, and then she taps him on the shoulder and says, refilled. And then she walks back to the bar. Um, and as she arrives back at the bar, the um, pu large flat pewter plates have been placed on the bar with steaming hot food on them. And she's picking them up and she, get, and she brings four of them at once, one in each hand and one on each arm. Um, and then she comes and sets them down in front of you. And everybody except for Herrick gets one on the first trip. 
Okay. And then when she comes back, or she goes, drops them all down, and then she comes back and she brings the, the, the fifth plate. Um, and then she also brings a small loaf of bread, uh, which has a knife stuck in the top of it. And the knife has a slab of butter on it, and the bread is warm, and the butter is melting down the knife as it sits there. Um, and she sets the fifth plate in front of Herrick, and then she sets the bread on the table in front of you. Not on a plate. And then she stops it uh, behind Klum and gives you like a little hug around the shoulders. And she says, I'm so glad you woke up. You too. And then she, there's some guys in the back raising their mugs and she goes, oh, pardon me, pardon me. And she whisks off and she seems to just be very comfortable moving in very small spaces. Like she goes between two guys whose shoulders are like this far apart um, and they just kind of let her go. Like they don't interfere with her at all. Um, again, the room is um, about half halflings. 30% humans and 20% elves. And there's about 40 people in the room total. So it's not a small number of people. Okay. Uh, everyone eating, I presume? Okay. Yeah. Um, the food is excellent. Uh, it's robust in flavor. Even the orange, uh, they look to be sliced leeks. Uh, have a very uh, distinct flavor. You think of rosemary and cinnamon baked into them and they're soft, like you can push your finger through soft. Uh, very good food. All right. Um, anyone doing anything else? I only say that as I'm, as I'm eating, I'm paying attention to how Gloom is eating in terms of how hungry she appears to be, and if that's affecting how quickly she's here, oh, she's eating good meal. Okay, yes, she is eating heartily. She is taking the time to chew, but that's about it. And she is enjoying the food, of course. It's very good. Okay, um, so you're, you know, six, eight minutes into the meal and you've already really put a good dent on the food. Um, and uh, Olivia has been delivering pies. Uh, they're eight inches um, and smell fruity. And uh, anyone who has knowledge of fruit somehow or other, survival, whatever, can guess that what kind of fruit it is if you want in advance. But anyway, um, and at that point, uh, a woman comes from the kitchen area and uh, she's actually carrying uh, four of the small pies, like cradled in her arms. She's older. You've, most of you have met her, but uh, Klum has not. And um, this is Lucille. Lucille is the grandmother of the family. She's extremely friendly, warm, and welcoming, and uh, she's the one who bakes the pies. And she brings the she brings out the four pies that she has and sets them on the table in front of the five of you. And uh, then she steps back for a second, is kind of surveying the room, making sure everything's under control. And you see that Olivia is going around and delivering pies to everybody that wants pies, about as fast as she can. And then. Uh, now seeing that it seems like everything is under control, Lucille, uh, who is, her hair is gray now, but you get the impression that it was probably reddish when she was younger because she does have freckles and she is very bare skinned. Um, and uh, she actually pulls a chair over and scoots up to the table with the five of you and sits in particular next to Klum, which puts her between Klum and Herrick. And then it goes Chiron, Lucas, a stirred round table. And so she says, she sits down next to you. And she says, do you find the food to your liking? Very much so. I knew you would. I was just being polite. So, do you feel well rested? I do. Although, I have to admit, I'm slightly confused still. 
Well, the town's all abuzz. We're pleased to see you up and about. These men must be like slave drivers. Drove you to the brink of exhausting, they did. It's a pretty hard day. Do you like the pie? It's wonderful. I knew you would. I was just asking out of politeness. The pies are always wonderful here. It's quite delicious. Prepared with much love and fresh ingredients. It's cherries. The pies are cherry today. I was going to ask, but I wasn't sure if I was. Soft, yeah, sweet. Stay tuned for more Lomunian adventures.